sing, He is exalted. Let's all stand and sing out, He is exalted. singing is outstanding on a dreary rainy day. What a blessing, what an encouragement. We thank you for that. It's good to have you back with us for this second session of the day. We also again thank those who are joining us by means of live stream. We're very glad that you're uh, watching in at this time. I trust that you'll remember that we are receiving a love offering for the expenses of this meeting. And there are various ways that you can give and participate. I would remind you that you can do so uh, if you're here or even if you're watching online, you can do so by text. You can do so by our PCC website, or you can do it by mail. And for again, for those of us that are here in the auditorium, we can use the offering boxes that are available out in the lobbies or there in the atrium. And I, I would say one more time, if you are making out a check, please make it out to Pensacola Christian College. That would help us so much as we uh, make use of those funds. Our speaker for this session will be Dr. John Lands. Dr. Lands serves as the executive vice president here at Pensacola Christian College. 
Before coming here, he served as senior pastor of the Fellowship Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia for 23 years. And God blessed that ministry with tremendous growth and expansion. Prior to that, he served as an assistant pastor both in Alaska and also in Tennessee. Dr. Lands has brought excellence and innovation to many areas of our ministry here. And we're just so thankful for his leadership. And we certainly look forward to the message he has for us this morning. But at this time, we're going to have Dr. Richard Anderson to come and lead us in a word of prayer. Dr. Anderson transitioned onto our Bible faculty in 2021 after a distinguished 24-year career in the United States Air Force. He served there as a chaplain and retired with the rank of Colonel. He holds both a Doctor of Ministry and a PhD in Leadership, and he brings a unique perspective to courses like Biblical Ethics, Life of Christ, and Marriage and Family. We appreciate so much the way that he has been used of God to challenge each one of us from our chapel, uh, a podium from time to time, and also in the classroom. We're going to ask Dr. Anderson, he would come at this time and lead us in prayer. After prayer, we'll have a special, and then after that special, Dr. John Lands will come with our message for this morning. Dr. Anderson. Heavenly Father, the ancient text reminds us to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Thank you for bringing us to this season, to this appointed time, to this historic period, a legacy Bible conference commemorating the 50th anniversary of Pensacola Christian College. Eternal God, your sovereign and sustaining grace in our lives is most visible when we look back and reflect. And as we do, we pause to say thank you. Your faithfulness to this community of faith and learning has been on vivid display over the last five decades. Thank you. As we look forward, we ask that your steady hand graciously guide us into the future, providentially protecting this institution and all who live, learn, and labor here. Having assembled to worship you now, our triune God, we humble ourselves before you, Father, acknowledging both the radiant splendor of your holiness and the filthy rags of our sinfulness. We confess that apart from you, we are nothing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking our sin upon yourself and for clothing us in your righteousness. We remain solely dependent on you in life, in learning, in leading, for we know that without you, we can do nothing. Be exalted in this service, O Christ, this hour, and further, be preeminent in each of our lives. Help us to walk worthy of your great sacrifice and victorious resurrection, remembering that you ever live to make intercession for us. Holy Spirit, endow our speaker, Dr. John Lands, with a fresh anointing from you Grant him clarity of thought and mind, as well as a holy unction to proclaim the Word of God with boldness and benevolence. Grant we who listen ears to hear and hearts to obey. Move among us, O God, during this service and grow us all into the image of our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Faith looks different in the dark Grace looks different now that I'm the one who's covered in marks Faith kneels longer when it's put through the war It's battered and sore, not like before 
I said I'd keep my eyes on you, O oh Father of lies. I thought that it was dark out, but then, then you sent the night. This is my midnight faith. This is me asking for grace. More grace, Lord. This is me on my knees. This is me asking you, please. Please hear me. Please see me, Lord. And though it seems I cannot find you, my darkness does not blind you. That is my midnight faith. Faith claims victory in the dark. Faith claims victory in the dark. Grace claims healing for the life that sin has broken apart. Faith shines brighter when it's put to the test. Still no regrets. I said I'd keep my eyes on you, oh Father of lies. I thought that it was dark out, but then, then you said the night. Then you said the night. This is my midnight. Your grace has covered me. It covers me. Even when I doubt it covers me. Every broken life, your grace can still redeem. In my darkest night, your grace has covered me. My deepest night, your grace has covered me. So this is my midnight faith. This is me asking for grace. More grace. you take your Bible and find the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16 this morning? The Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. While you're finding that, allow me to say how thankful I am to be a part of this Legacy Bible Conference. Dr. Shoemaker, thank you for your kind invitation to participate in, in this moment that I view historic with such a great lineup of speakers. And I'm thankful not only for the opportunity to be in this conference, but also the opportunity to serve at Pensacola Christian College, and I'm thankful for President Shoemaker and his friendship and the opportunity to serve alongside him. 
God is blessing this place and will continue to bless this place. And I'm thankful for what God is doing here. Around the globe, there are 195 countries recognized by the United Nations. And the United States has diplomatic relations with around 190 of those countries. Generally, there are U.S. embassies or consulates in each of those 190 countries. An American embassy is more than just a diplomatic outpost. Each symbolizes safety, protection, and the rule of American law and values. Despite their presence in a foreign land, these diplomatic missions are extensions of the United States. They're sovereign territories ruled by American laws, belonging to the country that they represent, not the country in which they reside. For this morning, I want us to focus on a much grander embassy, an embassy established by God himself within the tapestry of human history, the church. And just as American embassies carry the values and authority of the United States to distant lands, the church bears the divine mandate to bring the values and principles of heaven into this foreign territory we call the world. Philippians 3 verse 20 reminds us that we as believers have our true citizenship in heaven. And as part of the church, heaven's embassy on earth, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 reminds us that we're ambassadors for our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the whole point of the church is to represent heaven in history and to draw eternity into time. In our text today, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus speaks about the church. He says in verse number 18 of Matthew 16, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And with this statement, our Lord makes three declarations about his embassy, the church. The first declaration is about the church's solid foundation. He declared upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, 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 what or who is that rock? Well, to answer the question, you have to understand the context of Matthew 16. We're told in verse number 13 that Jesus has brought his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and that area is about 10 miles to the north of the Sea of Galilee. It's an unusual, interesting area in the fact at that time, it was the dividing line between the Jewish territory and the Gentile territory. Caesarea Philippi is a place you can visit today, a beautiful site, and there at the base of Mount Hermon, you can see in this, this uh, mountain, a grotto, a, a cavern of sorts that was believed in Greek, Greek mythology to be the birthplace of the god Pan. And even at the time of Christ, it was still used in pagan worship. And it's in that place, with that backdrop, Jesus asked the question, Men, whom do men say that I am? And each disciple popped up with an answer. Some say you're Jeremiah. Someone else said, some say you're Elijah. Another said, some say you're John the Baptist. And then Jesus gets rather personal and says, but who do you say that I am? And there's stunned silence amongst them until Peter speaks. Now, generally, when Peter speaks, you better look out. Anything he says is usually wrong and probably offensive. But in this moment, he gets it right. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Bible says in that moment, Jesus looks at him and says, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. 
Jesus is using a little bit of a word play in the Greek. The word Peter is the Greek word petros. It means a small stone. Upon you, this small stone, or you are Peter, the small stone, but upon this rock, Petra, it's, it's a word that would be used for the bedrock of a building. The wise man built his house upon the rock. It was that Petra, that deep bedrock foundation. And what Jesus is saying is, Peter, you got it right. I am the son of the living God, and I am the foundation of the church. With Jesus as the foundation of the church, there are three divine implications that we must note this morning. First of all, the church is eternal in God's purpose. Revelations 3 verse 8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Neither Lucifer's fall or or Adam's fateful choice caught God off guard. In his omniscient wisdom, he foresaw the pivotal moments that ushered in sorrow and suffering and shame. And yet from the shadow of a skull-shaped hill on a rebellious planet in the remote reaches of the galaxy, God unveiled his eternal answer, the cross, ordained for a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But just as the cross is eternal in God's purposes, so is the church. Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11 bears that out. It states that the church, integral to God's eternal design, would be purposed, ordained, and commissioned to make known the manifold wisdom of God according to the purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before the rustle of angels' wings disturbed the silence of eternity, before the first whisper of creation stirred the void, God had ordained there be a church. The church is eternal in God's purpose. Secondly, the church is historical in God's plan. We now move from infinite eternity that is boundless and endless to now linear history that has a beginning and end. But where in the timeline of God's plan does the church fall? To discover that, you have to apply the biblical hermeneutic of the law of first mention. The law of first mention is that principle that teaches that where a word or a concept or a thought is first used in Scripture, precedence is given to the understanding moving forward. Take your Bible and begin reading in the book of Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Continue reading through the poetry of the Bible and Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and and continue reading through all of the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and then continue reading through those minor prophets till you come to Malachi chapter 4 verse 6, the end of the Old Testament, and the word church is never used. Begin reading the Gospels. You begin reading in Matthew and you come to chapter 16, and there you find in verse 18 the first mention of the church. And Jesus again mentions it in chapter 18. But here's what's ironic. Continue reading through Matthew. Go to Mark. Go to Luke. Go to John. And you you never find the word church mentioned in those gospels. Oh, but you come to the book of Acts, and you come to Acts chapter 2, And the Bible says on that day of Pentecost, the Lord added daily into the church. And then in the rest of the book of Acts, 24 times the church is mentioned. And then continue reading through the epistles all the way to the book of Revelation, and you're going to find that the word church is used over 89 times. From Matthew chapter 16, the first mention And forward mentioning of the church, the the, the term ecclesia, church, is, is used 115 times. The first time it's mentioned is Matthew 16, verse 18. The last time it is mentioned is Revelation 3, verse number 22. And then from Revelation 4 all the way through to Revelation 22, verse 16, the epilogue of the book of Revelation, the church is not mentioned. Why? Because in the the linear historical timeline of the Bible, the church is announced in Matthew 16. 
It arrives in Acts chapter 2. Paul gives administration to it in the epistles. And in Revelation 3, the church is no longer mentioned because Revelation 4 bows out, bears out that there is a voice that says, come up hither, and the church is no longer on this earth. It is raptured out of this place. In the linear timeline of history, there is a beginning and an end to the church's dispensation on earth. The church is eternal in God's purpose, historical in God's plan. But I want you to notice thirdly, it is local by God's people. Christ has established that the church be local embassies representing the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The term church in English is a representation of the Greek word ekklesia. The word ekklesia was actually a word that was used in the classical Greek. It was a word that was used to describe those people who were representatives of the city-states of Greece, uh, city-states like Athens and Sparta. The term means the, uh, the, the gathering of the summoned, and it was their responsibility to shape the culture, the future of the city. Now, in Jesus' time, the word was kind of out of vogue. The Roman Senate had replaced the ecclesia. And Jesus takes that term that's been rendered obsolete, and he says to his disciples, you are a gathering of the summoned for a purpose. I call you together for the purpose as a local assembly. Study your Bible, and particularly the epistles. You're going to find that the placement of the church is described with three prepositions, in, of, and at. Paul writes to the Romans and he says, the beloved of God in Rome. He writes to the Galatians and he says, the churches of Galatia. He writes to the Philippians and he says, this is to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, in, of, and at. But notice the focus is not on the place, it's on the people. It's the beloved of God in Rome. It's the church of Galatia. It's the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. You see, it's not about where the church meet, it's about who gathers. And the church is local, not because of a building, but because the body of Christ meets there. Matthew 18, verse 20, Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And around this globe, there are gatherings of believers that mark local churches as heaven's embassy here on earth. Each Lord's Day, Christians gather in an apartment as an underground assembly concealed from government oppression. In America today, in rural Appalachia, there are plain cinder block buildings where simple saints gather together to sing hymns and hear the word. There are other stately structures adorned with stained glass windows and steeples stretching to the sky where saints gather to sing praise. There are modern, state-of-the-art worship centers with the latest technology and ample space. But here is the key. They are all equally the local church. And may I remind you, we must never forget this. That God is not impressed by the big nor embarrassed by the small. He just calls us to be faithful where we are. The church is built on a solid foundation that is eternal, historical, and local. He makes a second declaration about the church, and he speaks of the church's sovereign founder. He says, I will build my church. Now, notice three ways Christ confirms the sovereign ownership of the church. Number one, he is the Lord of the church. This is a helpful perspective for you when you're a pastor. I pastored for 23 years. It took me a while to realize it wasn't my church. Boy, the pressure was off when I did realize that. And I remember when I moved to Pensacola five years ago, I resigned my church. I could have retired there. God was blessing. The church was growing. The ministries were were moving along. But God placed something in my heart that I had to to, to move forward. And I remember some of my pastor friends would say, how could you step away from your church? And I'd look at them and say, well, that's how it is. It's not my church. It's his church. You see, the church is not to be a monarchy run by the pastor. It's not to be an oligarchy run by committees. It's not a democracy even led by the people. The church is a Christocracy led by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of the church. He's also the life of the church. See, the church is not just an organization. It's an organism. 
Colossians 1 verse 18 says that Christ is the head of the body, the church. You see, you can't separate the head from the body. A body without a head is dead. Can I have an amen? You know how I know they're connected? When Saul was persecuting the church, Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus. Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul was persecuting the saints, but Jesus felt the pain because he's part of the life. He is the life of the church. He's the Lord of the church. He is the life of the church. I want you to notice he's also the love of the church. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, verse number 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Aren't you glad Jesus loves you? Christ loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. And here's the principle. When Jesus is the love of the church, you can learn to love anyone. It was in my early years of pastoring I went to West Virginia to that little church of about 60 people at the age of 24. On that first Sunday, after I preached my first message, I went to the back doors. This is a small building, you know, one way in, one way out. I went to the back door after the message and was greeting the people. And a man came up to me and he shook my hand, looked me straight in the eye, didn't say good morning, anything. He looked me straight in the eye and said, I just want you to know that I have the spiritual gift of criticism. That'll bless your heart. (laughs) If I remember right, I I laughed out loud, but he didn't. I I later learned he not only had the spiritual gift of criticism, his love language was complaining. (laughs) He became an antagonist to me. I remember one time in a business meeting, he stood up and attacked me personally in front of the entire congregation. He was a problem. I probably should have just told him to pack up and head out. Maybe I was just naive and didn't know better. I didn't. I started praying about it. I say this to my shame. I started praying the imprecatory prayers of David. You know what the imprecatory prayers of David are. David prayed that his enemies would be destroyed. My favorite was Psalm 35. Verse 8, let destruction come upon him at unawares. (laughs) Verse 6 was my ultimate favorite. Let his way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord persecute him. Can I give it to you in the King John Version? Let him fall and break a hip. Can I have an amen? (laughs) Every Sunday night, this man would come to my office right before the evening service and he would stand in my door and tell me everything I'd done wrong said this wrong, didn't give this announcement, you could have done this differently, this program's not right, these people are not right, everything was wrong. It was in the sixth year of my ministry at Fellowship, one particular evening, he did just that, and I remember that evening, I just went about my business, listened, it was kind of as if I'd heard it so much, it was like Charlie Brown's teacher, wah, 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 wah. I remember I just folded up my Bible and got my notes, and I just got up, walked away from my desk, and started walking down the hall. And and on this particular day, he decided to follow me and continue his monologue. I I describe it like he was a yapping dog. He was just, yep, 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 follow me on my heels. And that church that we were in at that time, it was our second building after, the, uh, after that initial growth that we had. Uh, my office was on the lower level and the sanctuary was on the upper level. And I remember I was walking up the stairs and he, he stayed at the bottom of the stairs and was just yip, 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 saying everything that was wrong. And I turned around and something happened that was not of John Lance. I walked back down those stairs, stood directly in front of him put my hand on his shoulder and I looked in his eyes and I said, Richard, I want you to know that I love you and I pray for you every day. 
Now, I didn't tell him I was praying God would kill him, but I, I, I was praying for him. <laughs> and in that moment, tears welled up in that old hard-hearted West Virginia's eyes. And he said, preacher, I have never had a pastor tell me they love me. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, I know why. <laughs> my relationship changed with him. I began to understand him better. His dad was a pastor. His dad was rather stoic, if not legalistic, and, and never told him he loved him, even as a dad nor a pastor. And, and Richard felt like he was called to the ministry. He went to Chattanooga to a, to a university to prepare for ministry. He got kicked out. Never felt like he measured up. So at least if I'm going to be in church, I'm, I'm going to have a little fun with it. So he just tried to make every preacher as miserable as he could. He said, I, I, I never had the respect of anyone. And in that moment, our relationship changed. It changed so much that when we went to our building program, we moved our campus from our, our current location when we were landlocked. We moved to 25 acres just down the road. I put him on the building committee. And the Lord used him to be able to help give and direct that building program. And I learned a lesson. And here's the lesson that I hope you learn from this. That when you're in ministry, when you're in the church, you've got to learn to love people where they are and lead them where they need to be. Aren't you glad Jesus does that? Jesus doesn't say, hey, come to me when you get cleaned up. Come to me when you get your attitude straightened out. Come to me when you're perfect. Listen, none of us could come to Christ. But he shows us grace. And the grace that Jesus gives us in love should be the love that we give to others. And by the way, if Jesus loves them enough to die for them, you can love them enough, love enough, love them enough to live with them. Jesus is the love of the church. There's a third declaration. He speaks of the church's secure future. He says in verse 18, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He speaks first of all of the enemy of the church. The enemy is hell. The true enemy of of the church is, is not the, the, the individuals of this world. It's not the pornographer, the drug dealer, or even the abortionist. Yes, they're under the influence of the adversary, but you know what? A pornographer can be saved and be part of the church. A drug dealer can be radically transformed and be part of the church. Even the abortionist with no respect for life can experience eternal life through Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sin. Paul reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our enemy is not this world and the individuals working it. It is ultimately Satan's hell and his minions. He speaks of the enemy of the church, but he also speaks of the authority of the church. He says in verse number 18, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you write in your Bible, circle two words. Circle the word gates in verse 18. Circle the word keys in verse 19. Why is it that the word keys is in plural? May I submit to you, it's because gates in verse 18 is plural. Well, when you see gates mentioned, it always harkens back to the Old Testament. That was the place where business was conducted. The city gates was a place where, where, where business would be taken care of. And what Jesus is saying is this, that for every hellish gate, there's a corresponding kingdom key. I think it behooves us to pay attention to what Jesus is saying about these keys, particularly what is the purpose of the key. He tells us in verse number 18, he says, the purpose of the key is to restrict whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. The purpose of the key is to release whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Interestingly, Jesus repeats this releasing and restricting phrase in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, and in both chapter 16 and chapter 18. It is interesting the word bound and loosed is used as a Greek perfect passive participle. It's really not conveyed in the English as clearly as we could because we don't have anything like it. And when you, when you understand that, you can read this text this way, whatsoever you forbid on earth must be that which is already forbidden in heaven. 
And whatever you permit on earth must be that which is already permitted in heaven. It's really the reiteration of what Jesus taught in the model prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some have taken this verse and said that we instruct heaven to do our bidding. Oh, but that's not the case. We're not instructing heaven of our will. We're just aligning our will to heaven. We're just ambassadors for Christ. We're, we're just the servants of our king, and our authority is derived. We, we just do our king's bidding. A while back, I was preaching in Hickory, North Carolina with Brother Scott Hooks at Tabernacle Baptist Church. And while there, he arranged for me to, uh, to stay at the courtyard by Marriott that's just nearby the church. When I went to the hotel, they gave me a, a key card for room access. It authorized me to move freely in and out of that room. I went to dinner that evening with the pastor, and then I came back that evening. The next morning, I got up. I left to preach. After I was done preaching and having lunch, I came back. I had free access to that room at that courtyard by Marriott. Now, usually whenever I go out to speak, I try to fly back on the earliest flight. If I can't get a Sunday night flight, I'll fly out on the first flight on Monday morning. This was the case. I was going to fly out at 5 a.m. on Monday morning, and Pastor Hooks was so gracious. He said, I'm going to get you a hotel down by the Charlotte airport. The airport's about an hour and 10 minutes away. You don't want to be driving out at 3 in the morning to catch a 5 a.m. flight. I'm going to get you that, that, airport, that airport, uh, hotel at the airport. I said, thank you so much. That afternoon, I packed up all my stuff at the Marriott, and Put it all in my roller bag, went to the service, preached, and after I preached, I just got in the car and drove down to Charlotte. When I got to my hotel in Charlotte, I, I went and got a key, checked in, put that key in my pocket. Pulled my roller bag up to the room that they gave me. When I got to the room, I pulled the key out of my pocket, and I, I put it on that little tap area where the key is, and got a red light. Mm. Did it again, thought maybe I didn't do it right. <clears throat> Red light. Did it a third time. I was mad. Listen, I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I've preached all day, I'm getting ready to get up for an early flight. I had to go back to the front desk, so I drug my roller bag behind me, went down to the front desk. I had that key in my hand, and I plopped it down on the desk, and I said to, her, to the desk clerk that was there, that key doesn't work. She smiled and said, of course it doesn't work. That's a Marriott key, and this is a Hilton hotel. <laughs> she said, Marriott keys don't open Hilton doors. Can, can I make this application? I think today the church is trying to open doors with their own keys. Many complain about the church being ineffective or lacking authority to address the culture. There are, there are now books that you can purchase about how church doesn't work. But I want to give you a gentle reminder. Marriott keys don't work on Hilton doors. Secular philosophies can't meet spiritual needs. And the marketing of the church should never replace the message of the cross. Jesus says to us, I've given thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He then speaks of the victory of the church. He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you know anything about the, chess, about the game of chess, you know that it all comes down to when the king on either side can no longer move. Once the king is trapped, the winning side declares checkmate. And the game is over. There's a painting that once hung in the Louvre in Paris. It was by Frederick Retsch. Its, its official name is the Chess Players. It, it became popularly known as Checkmate. The painting depicts two chess players. One, Satan, who appears arrogant and confident. And the other player is a man who looks sad and, and defeated. <laughs> if Satan wins, the man loses his soul. One day, there was a chess grandmaster visiting the Louvre, and he was enjoying the art, and as he, as he went through the museum, he, he came upon Checkmate. He began to look at that, that painting. He was intrigued. 
After staring for a long time at that chessboard in the painting, he finally noticed something surprising. He noticed that the typical interpretation of the painting, that the devil had the man in checkmate, was incorrect. The chess grandmaster called the curator of the museum and he said, you must either change that painting or its title because checkmate doesn't fit the scene. You see that forlorn player? He could actually defeat the opponent. He just doesn't realize it yet. But his king has one more move. And today the church seems as if we're defeated, full of despair. We've been marginalized in the marketplace of ideas and minimized in our influence on the culture. And it appears that the world has us backed into a corner and the the devil has us on the ropes. But we need not fear. Our Lord, the unconquerable King, proclaims, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Weary, worn, and worried church. Take courage and never forget, our King has one more move. Father, thank you. Father, thank you for Jesus, who's the foundation of our church and gives us the secure future. And now, Jesus, we pray, even so, come quickly. Amen. Thank you for that great message. I was saved August 11th, 1969, and from that day to this, the Church of the Lord has been central in my life, and I'm so thankful for it. What a great message this afternoon. Let me just give you a real quick uh, few announcements, and then we'll be dismissed. Remember again that our 1.30 service this afternoon is hosted in three different locations. Uh, If you're planning to attend Dr. Bradley Edmondson's session on world missions, that's in the McKenzie Great Hall. Mr. Josh Hershberger's session on biblical worldview is over in the DHA. And then Pastor Matt Tice's session on evangelism is right here in the Crown Center. Now, students, you'll want to have your PCC card ready at the door to tap for attendance. If you can't recall which service you chose, you can find your selection on the Eagle's Nest uh, event sign-up page. For staff, faculty, and our guests, if you're planning to attend one of these sessions, we anticipate that the Crown Center and the Dale Horton Auditorium uh, have uh, most space, although there will be a limited number of additional seats in the McKenzie Great Hall as well. Now, the 11 o'clock lunch shift today will be for students with teal meal cards, and then anyone can eat at the noon to 1230 shift. Also, I want to just mention to you that uh, the the sports center will be open late tonight. After all the spiritual refreshment of this week, we thought you might enjoy an extended time of recreation. So the sports center will be open until midnight after tonight's final conference service. So again, remember all these announcements. You are dismissed. We'll see you at 1130. God bless you.